Okay, we've already talked about quite a bit of this material. You can't hardly help but talk about it, you know, and can't hardly go find it in the book and then switch back. So some of this stuff we'll just cover lightly. Basically, the strength of a structural member or the load applied to that member, if you tested them a thousand times, how many people are here? Maximum. We wouldn't test it during uh, 8, 8 o'clock at night. You'd find it's a random number. Probably got quite a bit of variation on it. Maybe, who knows, you might have to take the average and multiply it times 1.6 to really get the worst case we found somewhere in Tulsa or someplace. And the strength of the member that you're designing, if you make a thousand angles and you drill holes in them and they all look identical and you test them all, you'll find there's variation in them. And who knows, you may have to multiply the nominal, that's the, kind of the average, the mean of a thousand tests, the nominal strength times, I don't know, maybe times 0.75, knock off 25% of the strength that you do have on average, but you just can't count on it. There's basically your factors of safety by multiplying your loads in various combinations times 1.4, 1, what was the 1.4 for? Dead load alone. What, is de what does the dead load get in most all of the other load factor, load combinations? 1.2, see there's people gonna make an A. And then this multiplied times 0.9, losing 10% of the strength if it's welded because the wells carry the flow of load very nicely. And maybe times 0.75 if you drill holes in it, which are cause quite a bit of variation in the strength. And we're gonna, our job is going to make sure that under no reasonable likelihood will the loads exceed the expected strength on these structures. There's basically dead times maybe 1.2 plus, 1.2 minus, maybe three sigmas are in there. You're guaranteed or very likely to get about 68% of the strength between plus or minus a sigma. Uh, we're going to make you multiply it times 1.2 so that there's very little chance, if any at all, that the member strength will be less than the excessive dead load strength. Here's your live load. Got a, quite a bit more variation in it. That's why we make you multiply it times a larger number. Here's all your loads put together. There's the mean of the dead, the mean of the wind, and the mean of the live. Already multiplied times 1.2, or, or some factor. I don't have a factor because I don't know exactly which equation you're putting together right here. But the mean of all of them put together is somewhere out here, 150 plus 350 plus 650. And the variation is even smaller because you've had statistics. You know that if this has so much plus or minus three sigmas and plus or minus three sigmas and plus or minus three sigmas, when you add them up, this one is probably here, when this one is probably here, when this one is probably here, and you add all those probabilities up and you don't get as much variation. Uh, this would be my way of doing things. I'd have the loads down here and the resistance is up there. And then nothing would ever fall down. It wouldn't be possible. Price, $87 million. Probability of failure, well, there's still a little because there's a possibility. You know, this thing never goes to zero. But, I mean, I can live with that. You know, but you can't because we'd only have one building on campus. That's all we'd be able to afford. So we admit that there's some small, negligible, we haven't even seen it happen yet, where the loads could just be beyond belief and the resistances are just terribly shoddy and where you could have a failure. But that probability is so close to zero, we're willing to live with it. 87 million? No, off by a factor of 10. So this is probably the building that they're building now. This is this number here. 
This is dead plus wind plus live, or whatever plus whatever plus whatever, 1.2, 1.6, 0.5, stuff like that. That's what you're going to be calling your ultimate request for capacity, generically called R, called P for axial loads usually, call it whatever they want to, called M sub U for what? What? Multiple. Multiple. Oh, well, it's ultimate, yeah, but what would M probably stand for in your world? Moments, and V would be shear, and yeah, and those kind of things. So those are typical symbols. The only thing is subscripted with a U is a request, an ultimate request for load carrying capacity of whatever you propose to hold up that load. It'll be the sum of the dead load times an appropriate multiplication factor of safety load factor, whatever you want to call it, plus some wind, plus some live, plus some live roof, plus whatever the combination is that you're working on. And you'll work on all of them. Every, your structure will have to withstand <coughs> all of those combinations. Got a little statistics. You've already had uh, probability and statistics, so it's not my job to show you. But it's worth a page or two saying somebody did it, and you can check it out if you want to. Basically, they're going to get a curve that says the chances of the load ever exceeding the resistance that we have made available is a very small number, and that's been set by your peers to be negligible or close to it. The manual we already discussed Shortly, briefly, there is a uh, flip class out there that I want you to take a look at. I think it's 15 minutes long. It's longer than most of them. And it goes through where to find things in the book. And if you don't view it or if you don't really on your own figure out where all these things are in the book, it'll be really easy to tell because your highest grade on a quiz will probably be about a 60. And you can always tell that person. You watch. You'll be sitting there, and you'll turn to this page, and you'll start writing equations. And the guy next to you, you'll be going. And the wind will come off of his text. And he's looking for that page because he doesn't know where it is. It's out there. Look at that. Look what we're going to do today. you believe that? So. It's broken up into parts. Here are your page numbers in the tech in the in the manual. There'll be I'll put them in uh, brackets or braces so that you know that I'm talking about go to the red book as opposed to this is page 34 in our notes. And you'll see some pages 34A, 34B, 34CA, 34CB, you know, as I as things go in there, they just have to uh, take whatever page number they can get. Dimensions, where you're going to find the properties of the wide flanges. General design considerations, how you design flexural members, how you design columns. These parts are mostly tables to assist you in the design. They're not, although they are compliant with the specifications, they are not the specifications. All the specifications are in part 16. So tension members, combined loading, bolts, wells, connecting elements, simple shear connections, blah, 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 part 16. 16 is a mess, but as things have been added over the years, they've had to do the same thing I've had to do, is add chapters and parts and subscripts and everything else. Basically, the specifications go from 16.1 to 16.1. They're all 16.1 down in here. Page 1 through 240. Those are the specs. And then from page 241 to 552 is a commentary. In the specs, you have the main specifications. At the tail end, there are some appendices. In the commentary, they'll have the same numbering system. So if you want to find out something about information on page 
uh, 16.1-36. There's a corresponding page back in here that gives you comments on that material. And it's usually very helpful. They'll have example problems in it. They'll have why it was done the way it was done. Here's the stuff you'll find out there on the uh, flipped class. Uh, I think it's on lecture th three. I forget where it is. But it's just uh, basically use of the AISC steel construction manual. Blah, what's in there, 17 parts. What's in a part, usually got a scope and then for instance, part one, dimensions and property, and then sub things that scope, structural products, wide flanges, channels, so on. We'll discuss all that in a 15 minute commentary. This is the only part that's got chapters, so if a book tells you to go to chapter three or chapter A or chapter anything, they're talking about in the specification. That's the only one that's so big and so detailed they had to have chapters in them. Tell where all this stuff is. They got a table of contents. 16.1-5. Page 35H. Oh, this is our page, 35H, this page. And it'll tell you, general provisions, Design requirements, these are chapters. A, chapter B, these are in part 16. So there's 16.1-8. That's what these numbers mean. They got symbols. They got general provisions in chapter A, design requirements in chapter B. And on and on and on. Heck, not my fault. I didn't do it. I'm sure if somebody did it today, they would organize it in a different fashion. But this thing is built on a book that's, I don't know, 30 years old. And as new things were invented and new materials were found, uh, they would add little sections inside of the thing. And so it is what it is. They tell you you need to be in Chapter G. Believe me, you're going to be in Part 16, where the specifications are. It's the only one that has chapters. There's Chapter G, Design of Members for Shear. Things like G1, G2, G2.1, the equation for shearing capacity. What is that? Shear. What is the N? Nominal. Very good. I think I mentioned the word a couple of times, but I'm not sure that you'd pick up on that. How does that compare with V sub U? Ultimate. Ultimate request. You will be told how to get V sub U. And once you know how much load you have ultimately been requested to handle U ultimate, you will go find out your proposed member how strong is it nominally? You find out how strong it is nominally. A nominal strength is the average of a thousand tests or your 305 way of finding out how strong something is. And you are not permitted to use V nominal. Well, you have to multiply nominal times to turn it into design numbers. Point 0.9, that's right. Or point 0.75, that's right. Sometimes times one. Sometimes the things are so reliable and so guaranteed, you don't have to drop it down by anything. Those are called resistance factors. So you have load factors. What does the load factor do? What does the load factor do? It's like a factor of safety. Does it go up or down? It makes it go up. And what does a resistance factor do? What does a resistance factor do? Makes it go down. How much? 0.9. See, he's only got one answer. 
And it's perfect. That's the right answer. Unless it's point unless it's point seven five, you know, or something else that they have decided. Those are the two most common ones. And so that's exactly what he's gonna do in here. He's gonna always tell you nominal strengths. And then somewhere else, I don't have this page, but probably on the well, here's one right here. In fact, here it is for this one. For sheer, here it is. The resistance factor to be uh, applied and multiplied to your nominal capacity is 0.9. And then, of course, it's this for loud stress design, but they work totally differently than you and I do. They divide by 1.67, and that's nowhere near 0.9, but they get their loads differently than we do, too. No, no, I'm not. This is the way it is. Uh, chapter D lists requirements for design intention members it's on this page. Once you get to Chapter D, there's subsections, and underneath there, there's more subsections. Examples. There is Chapter D. You'll notice this is Chapter D. This is Section D1, and this is uh, equation, see how it's inside of D2, and it's the first equation? And so they'll say, in Segui, you'll say, go see equation D2-1. And you'll say, huh? What do you mean? Well, it's in the specs. <clears throat> it's about the only place you're going to find equations. And you're going to go to chapter D, and you're going to go to section 2, and you're going to look for the first equation. This says that P nominal, not yet multiplied times the resistance factor, is equal to the yield stress times the gross area of the member. That's why you don't need a book when you take an exam, because it's all right here. All Segui has done is pulled it out and condensed it into much less space with a lot of explanations. So as long as you got that red book, you're good to go. Got to have it tabbed, probably, <clears throat> so you know how to design a tension member. And the appropriate number for yielding in the gross section, 0.9. However, if you have holes in it, you reduce the gross section, gross meaning nobody took out any money yet, all the money that's in the cash register during the day is the gross receipts, Net, of course, is after you pay the people and after you pay Uncle Sam and after you buy your stuff that you need to run, you get net proceeds or net money. That's the same way after you drill the holes, you have a net section. And since he says net section sounds like you drilled a hole in it, guess what fee becomes? 0.75. And what do you do to get it? The nominal strength? You multiply the ultimate stress the uh, as opposed to the yield and you multiply times something called A sub E. And what is A sub E? I don't know. It's an effective area according to this. Ah, here it says how do you calculate effective net area? It says to get the area effective, you multiply the net area, that's including the fact that there's some holes missing, times a thing called U. And where are you going to get U? I don't know, but it's somewhere. My book is on a tab. Where is it actually? Uh, U is called a shear lag factor determined in table D3.1. Where is this at? Next page. Oh, no fair. you got a book with you. <laughs> That's no fair. Yeah, but generally speaking, it is in section D in part 16, 16.1, Section D, 3.1. I don't think the table is actually, it's not on the next page, you know, but there's a table in there somewhere with that number on it. And it tells you member properties, and it tells you gross area, gross and net determination. How do you get to gross area? He says, well, it's everything that's there. It's the total cross-sectional area in the tables. What is the net area? The net area is... Uh, uh, of a member is the sum of the products of the thicknesses and the corresponding widths computed as follows, blah, 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 and then about a half a page to tell you how to compute it. For anything they've seen, 
Somebody will come up with something new. He tells you how to get the job done. There's that table right there. Happens to be further down the road. You know, when he tells you it's in the table, you don't always find it on the next page. The shear lag factors. There is you. For all tension members where the tension load is transmitted directly to each cross-sectional element by fasteners or wells, you don't have to reduce your net area to get your effective area. For these kind of things, uh, like a plate on a plate with wells on the side, depends on the dimensions of the plate. We get into all of it, but just generically, if you can't find this stuff quickly, then you will find it slowly. The more familiar you become with this, believe me, the easier life will be for you on an exam. So what's all the rest for? Well, there's some appendices in the back. I discuss all of that. They also have matching commentaries. Here's a typical appendix designed by inelastic analysis. Then the commentaries. You know it's a commentary. What's the commentary for? Well, the first part gives you, it just says, do this. This is how you will behave when you design steel structures if the code says use AISC uh, specifications. Then the commentary tells you why you ought to, and it tells you a lot of times who did it, who found out that's the right way, and where did they do the research to come up with these numbers. And they'll also tell you when you can deviate from those procedures if you've got a reasonable engineering per reason for doing so. Chapter D, you know it's a commentary, design of members' intention. That's what we'll be doing first. Oh, this is the commentary. Looky here. Commentary on the strength. Because of strain hardening, blah, blah, blah. I'll talk about that in a minute. The effective net area. So this is going to discuss how to get the area of a plate with holes in it. You know, he assumes you didn't take 305. Good enough. Here he shows you different things with holes in them. Shows you when the bolts are staggered. How long is the connection? Because that's one of the numbers in the uh, formulas. I don't know. That's all I know. It's a mess. It really is. Typical pop quiz. Where is this? And what is there? What's there? Where are you going to look? Part 16? No? Guy shaking your head no. Where are you going to find it? Part 7. That's exactly right. And somewhere in part 7, you'll see a figure 7-3. Where are you going to find this? Part 16. Part 16, chapter D. I mean, you know, these people have been doing it so long, they don't even think twice. They just say, go here. For you and me, that's a chore. That requires some practice. Here's the typical pop quiz answers. As best I remember, one is was wrong on purpose. It's always interesting to see who finds it. What's on page 2-48? That ought to be pretty easy, you know. You ought to be able to go to what? Go to what? Part 2 is what I was looking for. That's correct. Part 2. You look on page 48. But believe it or not, these are things that in the past I've really had some people say, I can't find this. What's D on page 2-10? I have no idea. But I bet you, you look around in there and you'll find what D is, probably because there's a picture along with it, and it shows you what D is. Uh, I don't know why. Oh, this is back to Sugui. Yeah, you know, you've had uh, precision and how many decimals to report in every engineering class you've had. I'm not going to worry about that. Homework problems. 
Chapter 3, Design of Tension Members. Probably the simplest, most straightforward thing that we design. First, a reminder that we're no longer using the symbol sigma. We're using little f to represent the real stress in the member that you're working with. And we'll be using capital symbols f for some kind of special stress like a yield stress for the metal or an ultimate stress for the metal. Here's a typical thing. It says uh, blah, blah, blah. Combinations of angles are included. 1 minus 12 or 1 dash 12. That's where you'll find angles inside of the AISC steel construction manual. So anytime I had to go dig around finding the page, I usually try and put that so you know where to look immediately. All kinds of shapes, tubes and pipes. Is that a, <clears throat> a bar or a plate? Somebody said yes. That's probably the accurate answer. Depends on what? Yeah, it depends on how dimension that is. What's the, what's the number that kind of splits the two thoughts? Five or eight is correct. It was eight inches. I don't know why. Why would I remember a thing like that? Can't remember. You know, did I? Yeah, I put on my socks today. But I mean, that's eight inches. That's an angle. That's a wide flange. That's a channel. There's a pair of channels with some cover plates welded to them. A couple of angles back to back. Basically speaking, here's a plate. They're going to bolt the ends. The bolted ends are going to do good or bad to the plate? Bad. What would be better? Welding. Man, y'all picking this up in a hurry. Good deal. Uh, the stress in this section is going to be higher because there's less metal, obviously. Turns out that the real thing that's going to kill this bar or plate in around this area here is when these stresses around those holes reach the ultimate. In the middle, what really hurts the plate is when this middle piece reaches the yield. The reason is, is it's so long, you know, it could be 20, 30 feet long. And because even though the stress is less than this, it is elongated so long that it's possible the building is out of shape. Doors won't open or close. Nobody's dead, but they're screaming like they're dead. Get me out, get me out. And not only that, really that can cause distress in other members because of excessive deformation here, can throw some load into another member that is not as able to pick up that load. Here is the gross section. Here is the gross area. Here is the net section. <clears throat> Here's the top plate is the gusset plate. The bottom plate is the main plate. This is eight inches wide by half inch thick. Got some holes in it. According to them, they are seven eighths inch diameter holes. Person probably used a seven eighths inch drill. My guess is <clears throat> they're not using seven eighths inch bolts in this thing because they'll never get it together. Uh, if you put this on top and drill them in place, you can get it together, but that almost never happens. Somebody punches this, somebody punches that one. And if you don't have a little slop in there, make the hole a little bigger than the bolt, you can't get it together. <clears throat> Again, uh, design. Here our attention members are covered in section D. Here are your specs and your commentary where you find that chapter D of the specs. Here's chapter B. There's the page numbers. This is the specification. And this is the commentary to the specification. Same way here, specs and commentary. Two limit states. One, if it breaks, that's bad. Two, if it deforms so badly that the doors won't open or some members someplace else are trying to pick up load <clears throat> that you hadn't planned on, that's bad. So typically... Here's a plate. The net area is 10 square inches. They found the area net by taking the width of the plate times the thickness of the plate, subtracting 
the width of this hole times the thickness of the plate minus another one. The load is coming. The loads are shown at the end, but of course the loads are, are pulling at the end where they're connected. Uh, it's going to fail across here. Or it can fail across the gross area. I've arbitrarily picked those numbers. I can I could easily do that. I can make the plate a 20 by 1 inch plate here and I can put the right size holes so that you lose exactly 5 square inches and 5 square inches there. This is called the net area across here in this region. This is called the gross area across here. Remember that equation? Do? Good. Where did it come from? 305. Did it come from 221? Didn't, did it? Only until you got into 305 did you learn how much deformation you get in a member. If deformation is a critical thing we have to watch for, then we're basically talking about PL over AE. P over A being this symbol for us as opposed to sigma times L over E. So that's one of the things you're checking for. And the... Um, sorry. P over A, we would have... This says delta is equal to PL over AE. Sigma is P over A. So I just replace it with what we're using for sigma. Too late to never mind. What do you mean never mind? We're already two minutes short. Now we all got to stay two minutes past class. You got to ask questions or if you don't understand or you won't get anywhere. So I didn't really understand the question. You saw through it, so, so let me know next time. Here is a 50 kip load placed on this item. The cross-section area is shown at this time. The net area's got little circles because it's got holes. The gross area is rectangles because it's a rectangular area. The stress is 30 KSI at the holes because there's less area. And the stress in the main plate in the gross area is 15 KSI. Same load, half the area, those are the numbers. Take 50 over, uh, 50 over area and 50 over area, you get these stresses. That's with 300 lo kips of load applied. In this particular plate, F sub Y is 50 KSI. You haven't reached that yet, so I have no complaints with your design. And the ultimate is 120 KSI. Just, I'm just picking numbers out of the air. I don't even think there's a steel that does that. Then once you put 500 kips of load on there, you divide 500 by 10, and you get 50. You divide 500 by 20, and you get 25. Here's the stress levels at the holes. Here's the stress level in the main plate. If you want to know the deformation right now, the deformation is, there's a little deformation around the holes, but the dang things are only like a half inch or an inch long. So when you do a PL over AE, when you do this L, when you do this L, there's, there's just no length. This thing part in here is like 30 feet long. I mean, all the deformation is going to be uh, the 25 KSI goes right here. The length is 30 feet, and he is uh, 29 times 10 to the whatever, sixth to get the deformation. And that's going to be some. Then, when you keep on adding loads, you go from 300 to 500, you can check the numbers. When you go to 800 kips of load, 800 kips divided by 10 square inches is 80. Ooh, look at that. Around those holes, this thing right here has gone up into the strain hardening range. And in the main body, 800 divided by 20 square inches is 40 KSI, and the loud stress guy is having a fit. You know, he's having a heart attack. Bring the little paddles. What's your problem? He says, you failed the bar. I said, no, I didn't fail the bar. Let me ask anybody in here. Is anybody worried? See, nobody's worried. He says, well, the stress has gone past yield. So, yes, these little holes have got little stretch marks on them. And, and they don't hurt a thing. So, nothing bad has happened yet. Now then, when, for this case, when you put 1,000 kips on there, 
The thousand kips divided by 20 square inches. Here's the calculations. Thousand over 20 kips. We've reached in the gross area 50 ksi, and in the net area, it's only 10 square inches. We've reached 100, still less than 120. Nothing has broken, but a failure has occurred. By that, nobody died still, but it is not serviceable. Once all the fibers in the main section reach 50, it's going to stretch quite a bit, and things are going to get really out of shape, and the doors aren't going to open, and all those bad things. That's something bad. That's the time you must stop. Now, I can just as easily show you a set of numbers, but the easiest thing for me to do was to, would be to make this 50 and make this 60. And then as this thing crawls up to 50 and 25, that's fine. And then I'd have it crawl up to 55 and half of 55, and that would be fine. And then you put a little more load on it, and this would get up to the 50 to the 60 KSI number before this number reached yield. That would mean that in that case, the little holes are starting to break. And I don't know which way it's going to be. So all i got to do is change the numbers on the steel or change the number of holes. I can change all kinds of things. So all I can guarantee is, number one, do not let the stress around the holes exceed the ultimate because they'll break. Do not let the stress in the gross area exceed yield because it will overstretch both of which will make this structure unserviceable. Now, invariably, if you really did break through some of these holes, it wouldn't go ahead and break. Hopefully, you know, you get the load off of it, and people will run out screaming, and still nobody probably going to die. Uh, and if you overstretch this one the same way, but both of them are a point where we say that's called a limit state. Yes, sir. On the holes? Yes, sir. Because the holes are so small. That's right. Because here's how much they stretch. Uh, when they started stretching was right uh, the holes. So here's the holes. They started stretching at 500 kips. So here they stretch uh, 500 times uh, half an inch divided by the cross-sectional area that's still in the plate divided uh, by E. Nothing. I mean, if you took it all apart, you'd look at it, you know, it's underneath a washer and underneath the nut, and you say, you know what, this, this thing was stretching. And I say, probably so. You didn't even know it. You didn't care. When this thing stretches like that, you know it, and you really care. So those are your, what we call, limit states. The book and the AISC manual will say uh, R sub U, or not R sub U, because that's your request, uh, P, sub, P sub N is equal to this, and then right underneath it they'll say P sub N is equal to something else. And you've got to be sophisticated enough not to say, okay, well, if P sub N is this and P sub N is that, then these two are equal. It's not what he's telling you. He's really telling you that there are two things policeman that you have to check, and they both have a gun. <clears throat> it's your job to see which one is more restrictive and select that as how strong the member is. So in the terminology, load has to be less than stress times area, nominal strength, nominal strength will be yield times gross, or Nominal strength is ultimate times effective area. The effective area, the reason he doesn't write down a nominal right there is because sometimes the stresses are so badly distributed as they go between one member and the next that you, it, it really hurts what they call the efficiency of the joint. Now, in the case of plates, the loads are transmitted very nicely from plate to plate, and they're 100% effective. But once you start bolting angles onto something else, the loads take a more uh, circuitous route. 
torturous route and uh, the joint just won't hold as much load as you think. And so we're going to have to account for that. What I told you in this class, they account for everything now. There's nothing left that's not the truth. Here's your ultimate request. Your ultimate, I'm sorry, this is your uh, nominal strength and this is your resistance factor. Here is your ultimate request. This is your 1.4 dead. Or this is your 1.2 dead plus 1.6 live plus those things. You take the largest one there. This nominal strength right here will either be gross section yield. That's yielding on the gross section. Or it will be net section fracture. See if I label those. Fails in gross section yield first. Doesn't fail in net section fracture. Your job, of course, is to make sure that your ultimate request is below your design strength. Whether this is a P or an M or a V, whatever you're working with, whatever you're trying to see if the uh, piece of steel will handle. Generally speaking, if you're talking about something yielding, we're talking point nines. Doesn't have to be. You have to look in the specs to see the particular answer you're talking about. But generally, if it's a yielding failure, they make you drop down the nominal strength to about 90% of the nominal. And 0.75 if it's actually going to tear in half, because that's obviously a more critical thing uh, that would happen to you. Allowed stress design, don't even look at it. Quick summary, what do all these symbols mean? They come fast and furious. R sub U is your ultimate request for carrying, load carrying capacity, be it M sub U, P sub U, you name it. It is a factored load, it can be P sub U, M sub U. It's found by multiplying 1.4 times dead or 1.2 dead, 1.6 live, or other things. The two most common, it almost always is either this one or this one. But it can be anything. It depends. R sub n is your nominal strength. That's the average of 100 tests or 1,000 tests. Or it's what you'd find from your 305 book. It is yield times gross. Or it is ultimate times effective, and effective is net times a joint efficiency times something that takes into account do, do the stresses flow nicely from all the elements coming in to all of the steel elements coming out. Elements being like an angle, it's got two elements. One sticks up in the air and the other's flat. Like a Wide flange. Wide flange has got webs and flanges. Those are elements of the shape. B is an appropriate resistance factor, generally speaking. B R sub N is your design strength. So when the homework problem says find the design strength, this is what they're looking for. When they ask you for the nominal strength, and you give them this, they count off because he wants you to know the difference. He wants you to know there's an average of a 1,000 tests, which we unfortunately are not permitted to use. And then there is a design strength, taking into account the variation we find in the nominal strength. Your ultimate job is still this. Keep your requests. Your ultimate request below your design strength. Over the years, I draw figures and figures and figures, and you're just going to have to put up with them. They just come up all over the place. Gross area, net area, you'll notice that's what was drilled out. There's the calculation. The diameter of the bolt is, let's say, it's a three-quarter inch bolt.
You'll never get it together if you use a three-quarter inch drill. So they practically add a drill. When the guy pulls the, or the lady pulls the drill out of the box, they add a sixteenth of an inch to the drill size. When you drill or punch the hole, you make a pretty good mess out of the hole itself. And they make you add another sixteenth inch. You will not see it. But they make you assume that the hole size is a sixteenth inch bigger because of the damage done to the hole. So that would be what you'd call the hole size. Here's the load coming down a plate. The load here would run into one hole and cause stresses across here. The load would be P over the stress would be P over A. The area being what kind of area? A net, that's right. Whoever said effective is also right. They're both the same for plates, bolted to plates. Down in here, you'll notice that some of the load has dropped out. It's just like water coming down a trough. Uh, total holes that the water can get out is nine. Total load, bolts the, thing can, the load can get out is nine. So by the time the load gets past this bolt, some has been transferred out. Here you only have eight ninths as much load. You still have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight out of nine. That's how much load is here. And then you would use an area with two holes taken out. Right across this section, what would your load be? Six, correct. Six ninths of the load P and divided by the area with three holes. You'd probably have to study, you might have to study all three of those sections to find the worst case. I mentioned earlier that the codes and the specs change. Here's the old AISC and also the ASCE specs. See the 1.6 wind, case four. And of course, I think you know, I don't th think I copied it again, but this was changed to 1.0. And if you look in the commentary, you'll see exactly why they did that. Already discussed load comma. Oh, this is where it is right here. Uh, in the past, wind and solo is historically associated with returns of 50 years. Now then, they've gone to 700 years because these things were happening too frequently, you know, getting too much wind. Some more of the same, more nice pictures. Where is all of it? We'll take a look at this. It'll tell you exactly where it is and what page they're on. Symbols. There's your fee. There's your fee intention. Here are the pages you can find what they are, the values. Here's the stuff that Segui has in the book. There's the equation he gave you because that's the, he got it right out of the specs, chapter D. Here's the effective area times U, page it's on. Take a, I mean, you say, ah, wait, 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 I can't keep up. Just pull the notes. And here's the commentary on design of members for tension. So good enough, we'll quit there. Yes, sir. Yeah, the net area, in this example, even, so we're using both the... the you are not designing the gusset plate. So the, the net reason, only the plate area. That's for us. Yeah. And the only reason he's not designing the gusset plates is he hasn't told you the dimensions. Okay. So that must be Joe's job okay. because, and he's wondering, what, where's the plate? Well, that's your job. Okay. Um, email I sent you last night. Um, I was trying it on a uh, Samsung. Yeah, I read that, and I emailed you back, and I've added a couple of other formats. Have you seen that email yet? I haven't checked my Okay. Out. Well, give it, a, give it a look. Uh, the format that I thought everybody could read was an MP4. 
And well, 